Salam world, I'm your shorter than average girl from Down Under and today we're going down memory lane, looking at the first book of the Del Toro Quest series, The Forests of Silence. So I apologize for those who watched Wednesday's video, this may seem a little repetitive, but Del Toro Quest. So Del Toro Quest was my childhood and many kids here in the Southern Hemisphere, as it probably was our first introduction to the fantasy genre. It is one of the many, many series written by the Australian author Jennifer Rowe, aka Emily Rodder. Now you're probably wondering, why is a kid's fantasy series even an option for analysis? So far, we've been looking at stories for adults to disguised as children movies, such as Snow White, The Lion King, Brother Bear, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, and so and so forth. Because these are actually adult stories, it's not surprising that we can find hidden meanings in them. But a kid story? Well, you'll be surprised. And then there's this anime, which was made in 2007, depicting the story of the first Del Toro Quest series. So today we're going to be starting off with book one, The Forest of Silence, and its corresponding anime episodes, episodes one, two, and three, which I did a child-friendly reaction to up here. But yeah, the reaction, it's more meant for a child audience. So if you're the adults, don't worry, you can stick around, I'm still gonna go through the novel. and. And if you're only here for the review for both the book and the anime, then you can click on the time shown on the screen right now or the timestamp in the description, whichever suits you best. But for now, let's talk story. <laughs> Starting off with context. Del Toro Quest is set in the fictitious land of Del Toro. Shock horror. The citizens of Del Toro are predominantly made up of members of the Seven Tribes. You have the people of Del, who are the travelers, explorers, and trading people. The Relids, a smart and hard-working people with their distinct blue skin and red hair. The Plains people, who are the aristocratic group. The Mare, a superstitious and game-loving people. So they're really into like gambling and sports and stuff. The Dreadnought gnomes, need more be said, the magic using taurins, and the large strong jawless. However, these tribes, well, they weren't friends. Feuds broke out between them all the time, which made Del Tora a prime target for the Shadow Lord, a strong magician from a faraway land who came and invaded the lands north of Del Tora. Now, the origins of the Shadow Lord aren't actually discussed in the Del Tora Quest series, but there's another Emily Rodder series, the Three Door Trilogy, which does go into the backstory of who the Shadow Lord is. So if you guys end up liking this Del Toro Quest series, then we can also do the Three Door Trilogy. But back to the story now. Now alone, the Seven Tribes couldn't really defeat the Shadow Lord, but God forbid they had to work together. Now this is where Arden comes in, a blacksmith from the people of Del. Arden dreams of this magical belt which has all the talismans of these seven tribes. These talismans being gemstones. These gemstones have magical properties and so in his dream when combined these seven gems would produce a magic which could repel the Shadow Lord from Del Toro. So Arden set out to make his dream come true. He built a belt and then went out to the tribes to convince them to give him the talismans that are protecting them from the Shadow Lord. He first goes to the Jalus people and gets the diamond, then heads north to the Dread Gnomes to get the emerald, then to the Mare people for the lap Lazuli before returning home to Dell and getting the topaz, then going north to the Relids to get the ruby, across to the plains to get the opal, and finally to Tora to get the amethyst. And just like that, his dream comes true. And it works like a charm. The belt is super powerful, and through the tests that each of the tribes 
put Arden through, they have actually come to like his character and trust him, and so they fought by his side. And for the first time, Del Toro was united behind Arden, and they did defeat the Shadow Lord, and so Arden became the first king of Del Toro. But the Shadow Lord wasn't dead just defeated. And so Arda knew to make sure the magic keeps working, he would have to keep the belt on all the time. Wouldn't imagine that'd be too comfy sleeping in. But as he keeps wearing it, the belt becomes contingent on Arden's blood. And so when Arden reaches the end of his life, only his bloodline could wield the magic of the belt to keep Del Toro safe. And so you end up with a monarchy. Now, this is perfect for the Shadow Lord, because a predictable pattern can be understood, and when it's understood, it can be manipulated. So the Shadow Lord sends advisors to these new kings and queens. First, they would influence procedures and protocols, but over time, this advice became the law. <laughs> And this king, which was once the people's king, is now just a puppet for the Shadow Lord, hated by his subjects. The manipulation went so far as to the king built a castle, which the advisor then laced with magic so that there's this hologram around it. So the king would look outside his window and see a beautiful city, whereas the people are actually living in slum and ruins. The belt was only worn during the king or the queen's coronation, and then locked in a tower, never to be seen again. And the king or queen could only marry someone who's been living in the castle their entire life, meaning that both members of the royal family had never set their foot outside the castle to actually know what the real state of the world was. So basically the advisors made all the decisions for Del Toro. This brings us to the beginning of this book, the coronation of King Endon. Now Endon and Jared have been besties from birth raised the same, taught the same, and they even had the same nursemaid and teachers. But the major difference is, is that Endon was the prince, and Jared is the orphan son of a man who died in the king's service. So the coronation would definitely have changed the nature of their relationship. Jared felt uneasy about the coronation, particularly the attitude of the chief advisor Prandine. Consequently, Jared did his research about the origins of the belt, and that's when he came to the conclusion that Prandine is actually a traitor and that Endon needs to keep that belt on all the time for his own safety and the safety of Del Toro. But when he went to tell Endon, who is grieving his father's death, Prandine interrupts and declares Jared the traitor. To save his own life, Jared ends up escaping from the palace and discovers the truth of what the outside world is. He is rescued by a blacksmith, Creon, and his daughter, Anna. And over the next seven years, Jared takes over the forge and marries Anna. And this is when an event occurs which changes the course of Del Toro's history. The castle is attacked by the Shadow Lord, the belt gets destroyed, and the gems are scattered. Jared goes back to the castle to help his long friend Endon, who regrets believing Prandine and letting go of his best friend. Now Endon, he was also busy in those seven years. He ends up marrying a magic-wielding Tauren named Sharn, who's an absolute G because she ends up killing Prandine by pushing him out a window. So Jared ends up helping Endon and Sharn run away from the palace, and now they need to think of a plan to defeat the Shadow Lord. Q 16 years later, and so this is where we get the start of the anime. Jared and Anna are still in the forge looking after their 16 year old son, Leaf. I mean, gotta hand it to them. That name is pretty original. Leaf is your average kid living under the Shadow Lord's rule, with the exception of the fact that he actually has an education and fighting lessons. Not to mention the render homeless guy named Barda living out front of his door. But you see, there's nothing random about Jared and Anna. This is the plan they've cooked up with the king and queen 16 years ago. 
Both Anna and Sharon were pregnant on that fateful day, and they knew that the only person who could wear the belt would be the queen's unborn son, because Endon had now lost the trust of his people and so would never be able to use the magic of the belt ever again. So the king and queen needed to look after their baby, and while they're doing that, Jared and Anna would see to the belt. What Jared wasn't counting on was a leg injury which rendered him unable to travel. And so he's going to train his son to do his mission for him. And where does Barda come into all this? Huh. Barda is actually the son of Endon and Jared's nursemaid as well as being a trained soldier himself. When his mother overheard Prandine's scheming, she was murdered, and fearing for his life, given that he knew what she overheard, he ended up running away from the palace, just before the hostile takeover. He ended up finding his way to the forge, and so Anna and Jared took him in. Over time, he's been sleeping outside listening to the news of travelers and grey guards to try and figure out where those seven gems are. When Jared's injury occurred, Bada actually volunteered to go searching for the gems himself. But Jared wanted to personally keep the promise that he'd made to the king via his sunleaf. So Barda not only had to wait for Leaf to be old enough to go on the quest for the gems, but he had to make sure that he stayed alive for that entire time, plus was ready and experienced enough to go on this journey. So cue babysitter Barda. <laughs> But finally, it is time. Leaf is ready to go and Bard is going to do everything that he can to shake him off gently. But Leaf ain't budging. So off they go down the Dalwen path to the Forests of Silence. See, a big difference here between the anime and the OG story was that Barda wanted to go to the forest first because he had intel that grey guards no longer go to that area. That path would be absolutely clear, meaning that their road would be hassle-free at the start. Whereas Jared wanted them to end at the forest because he deemed it the most dangerous location due to the superstition of the people of Dal. And so to prove himself to Barda, Leaf ends up siding with him and deciding to go to the forest first, even though he is scared out of his mind. And not gonna lie, this is one of the many dumb moves that Leaf does to prove himself, because the Grey Guards, they had the right to not want to go into the forest. They were being eaten alive, and that would have been Leaf and Barda's fate if it weren't for the trees taking fancy to them and getting their sassy lapdog Jasmine to save their life. She is also conveniently Leaf Sage, lives alone, is super resourceful, and knows exactly where they need to go to get the first gem. The originally named Dark. And so in the dark, there's this clunky golden armor which is possessed by the will of a really, really old Jawless named Goral. And he's just waiting there to kill them. But, of course, they defeat him. And la -dee da they get the topaz and the three Delians plus Jasmine's pets, Philly and Cree, are off on their next adventure. So, so far sounds like a generic child's fantasy book, right? Which it is. So the lore isn't super deep yet, and we can already start picking at the logic of some of the characters' choices. But what I like about Emily Rodder's books in general is how she leads her audience with these typical plots which at the end build up into this huge hidden truth after a single reveal. And so you end up going back and reading it again, but the plot is hugely different and so much more sophisticated. Like a single line or observation becomes a pivotal point. Now as someone who actually knows what's going to happen, because I've read them before, I'm going to be very careful about not revealing the end, but also 
focus on some of the important points, which may seem insignificant to the plot of just the book The Forest of Silence, but is actually quite significant at the end. And that's because we're not just going through the plot of the series and the lore of Del Toro, but we want to uncover the juicy psychological archetypes and how they change our characters for the better. So today's focus, we're going to be looking at the villain of our story, Goral, and his connection with the gem that he's protecting, the Topaz. He's like, he's one of the two or three guardians which don't actually know that they're guarding one of the seven gems. We can excuse the other guardian for not being like an intellectual being, but Goral is a humanoid. He's intelligent. So how could this fact elude him completely? And to be able to understand that, we actually need to go back to Goral's origin story. So, before the time of Arden, Goral, along with his brother, Gredok and Gudden, went out searching for the fabled lilies of life. Lilies whose nectar are said to give the drinker immortality. Or so the fable goes. When the three brothers eventually find the lilies in the center of the middle forest in the forests of silence, Garl ends up killing his brothers so that he could take all the nectar for himself. However, in the quarrels, the lilies wither and so Garl condemns himself to wait for them to bloom again so that he may drink of their nectar become immortal, and then go and rule the seven tribes himself. To help the lilies bloom, Goral plants a vine dome to protect them, which is what is now called the dark, because it's a dome of vines and no light gets in, so it is dark. Get it? A thousand years later, and they still haven't bloomed. I wonder why. He would kill anything which dared to enter the dark, but it's important to note that when Goral first went to the Forest of Silence, the topaz wasn't on the pommel, or the crossbar in the anime, of the sword. But it was either still underground, or in the community hall on Dell, then later on, on the belt. So, Goral didn't actually know the significance of the topaz which he had. Or he didn't even know what the topaz was depending on what time he and his brothers traveled. This leads us to make two conclusions. One, Goral was so protective over the lilies that stories of his bloodshed had reached the Shadow Lord and so he deemed him a good fit to guard one of the gems. Further, the Shadow Lord also knew that he couldn't offer Goral anything for his service and loyalty, given that the only goal that Goral has were the lilies of life. Which means that the Akbaba just dropped the topaz into the dark and Goral's paranoia and curiosity did the rest of the work of the Shadow Lord for him. How? Well, let's start off with Goral. He's a proud, power-hungry, greedy, and ruthless individual. He deemed himself the most suitable candidate to drinking the lily's nectar and to rule the seven tribes, therefore justifying himself the sacrifice of his siblings for the greater good. In fact, he goes as far as saying, I... I had to do it. I could not share the nectar with them. I needed a whole cup of it for myself. My two brothers should have known that. Machiavellian indeed. His tunnel vision to his goal meant that he had no idea what was happening around him in his future kingdom. So no news was getting to Goral, but news of Goral was getting out. A traveler named Doran, who becomes a very significant character in the third Del Toro Quest series, actually met and escaped from Goral, warning people not to challenge him in his in-universe book called Secrets of Del Toro. And perhaps this and other rumors spreading around the forests of silence is what cemented Goral's reputation to the Shadow Lord. Not only that, the Shadow Lord is smart. He knew that he could use this to his advantage. Girl was already slaughtering anything that got in his way, so if he just added something else for Girl to protect, without Girl knowing that he's protecting it, well then, 
happy days. He knew that there was no need of communication with Goral. All he had to do is make sure the topaz got into the location near the Lilies of Life and Goral would protect it just the same. So, on that day when the Akbaba dropped the topaz, of course, Goral's first reaction is, oh my gosh, I'm being invaded. Something has just entered the territory, the dark. But then when he finds out it's an inanimate object, his curiosity takes the better of him. What is it? Why was it dropped here? So and so forth. After making sure that it isn't dangerous, then he can do whatever he wants with it. And how many of us know someone who would bypass the opportunity of keeping a precious gem? Particularly if they know that no trouble will come by keeping it. Zilch. And that's why Goral keeps the topaz. But then it begs the question, this is a magical topaz. Could Goral use its abilities? Well, to answer that question, we have to look at the powers of the topaz and compare it to Goral. If they match, it means that he was able to use the abilities of the topaz. And if they don't, it means it was just a decoration for him. So, the topaz's power. The topaz is the talisman of the people of Del a symbol of faithfulness. Its powers are closely connected to the mind and spirit. Things that it can do are clear the mind and strengthen it, guard against the terrors of the night, aka calming an individual, connecting a person with the spirit world so that they may communicate with the dead. And finally, it's the most powerful when under the light of a full moon. Now, Let's see Goral. Well, it's very difficult for us to say that Goral was smart by any capacity. I mean, he thought he was helping the lilies by making them stay in the dark for 1,000 years. After a 1,000 years, he never thought to himself, why aren't these flowers blooming? And when it came to him finding Leaf and Barda, with the fact that he is a fully trained soldier and has telekinesis, he wasn't able to defeat them. I think these are three clear evidences that his mind was never sharpened by the ability of the topaz. His paranoia also shows that he was never calm, meaning that the topaz's ability to guard against the terrors of the night were never used by Goral. And finally, connecting to the spirit world, although Goral shows remorse for killing his siblings whilst excusing himself for doing it, he has never really communicated to his siblings or any of the creatures that he's ended, which may suggest that he has never had that connection to the spirit world. However, there is something else that we need to take into consideration when it comes to Goral. He is a possessed armor. His body was dead for many, many years, and the only thing that was left is his will of wanting to drink that nectar. The only thing which gave him immortality is that power and strive that he had. But that was all gone when his armor was destroyed. So one actually kind of feels sorry for Goral. The fact that he has eluded himself for so many years that he had never come to realize that he was no more. He had died and that the only thing still alive was his greedy desire. Now, going back to the abilities of the gems and why Goral couldn't possess them, well, it could be because he no longer had a body at the time that he came across the topaz. If he didn't have a body, then he wasn't a mortal, and the topaz's ability to connect with the spirit world was between a mortal and someone who had deceased. But Goral was in limbo. He was in purgatory. So maybe the topaz couldn't affect him then. In the same fashion, Goral didn't have a mind, he didn't have a consciousness, and therefore the topaz's ability of clearing, strengthening, and calming the mind wouldn't work on him. His ignorance about the power of the topaz made him such a strong guardian, because someone who possesses something they don't understand will never be able to use it to its full capacity. Therefore, 
he'll never be a threat. And this is what the Shadow Lord saw in Goral, and therefore picked him as the guardian of the Topaz. Which means that we're giving the Shadow Lord a lot of credit for his decision. We can actually take a lot from Goral's story and apply it to our life. Sometimes we set goals for ourselves, milestones that we need to hit at a particular point in our life. But life can't be planned so thoroughly. Things aren't going to go right all the time. And this can make us very anxious. So what we end up doing to hold on to what we have is try to force that to come true no matter what. But in the process of forcing this particular thing to come true, we end up forgetting about life. Because we are so focused on this one goal, we have tunnel vision to try and fulfill this one thing but that recognizes the a million opportunities all around us, how time is passing, people are passing, because we're living in our own world. And that's what Garl was living in. He had built this illusion for himself, that he was protecting these lilies, that he needed to be strong for the lilies, so that he could get what he wished. But when the time came, he couldn't consume the lily's nectar. He couldn't be immortal because he wasn't mortal anymore. The longer we continue to tunnel with our goals, without them seeming closer or closer, the more anxious, stressed, and paranoid we become. We start to fear the future because it doesn't seem like the future we've set ourselves up for is coming to pass. And the more anxious, stressed, and fearful we become, the less rational decisions we start to make about our life. And the less rational decisions that we start to make, the more we're going to hurt ourselves and those around us. Metaphorically speaking, we need to keep the topaz in our pocket all the time. Those moments that don't seem so clear, to strengthen and calm the mind so that we can make the best decision when it comes to it. It's okay if we don't achieve the goal that we really want because it may not have been our goal to achieve to start off with. Being able to observe how life looks around us and finding the place where we fit into that is more of a success than pushing on with a goal which never has an end. We need to accept that not everything in our life is in our control, but those things that we do have control over, our bodies, our mind, our emotions, if we want to be successful, we need to make sure to perfect our control over them. Only then will we live a happy and successful life. And that's the moral I take from the first book of the Del Toro Quest series. Being able to see the contrast between Goral's persistence and Jared's persistence gives us an insight of what it is that we should aim to control in our life and what we should be patient with and let us go with the flow with. I like this book and personally I like the OG story for the Forest of Silence better than the anime episodes. But for someone who isn't too keen on reading, maybe the anime episodes are all you need. Although they don't provide all the context with Jared and Endon. Instead, the anime starts all the way in the middle of the first book, around chapter 8 of 16. But I'm guessing that's because they want Leaf, Barna, and Jasmine to be the main characters rather than Jared and Endon. It's a different medium, so of course the storytelling is going to be quite different. But as far as the book goes, it is a really light and easy read. It's really good for kids from the age of eight to kind of start reading, but of course that depends on the child's reading ability. But honestly, I can't fault it. There isn't really anything which would be deemed negative in any circumstance. Of course, as a grown-up, I can see a lot of flawed logic and missing pieces, but that's because the other books kind of start filling those bits in. With any universe, no one book is going to be perfect. You kind of have to put everything together to make sense out of it. I know that this video is pretty light compared to my usual content, but that's because I don't want to give any spoilers at the moment. We're just going to walk through the series as it goes by and and hopefully we'll be able to put all the pieces at the end.
So that's book one of series one, The Forests of Silence. Hope you really enjoyed this lighter video. If you did, please make sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. Next week we'll be going back to the usual movie analysis content, but in the coming months we will be continuing on with Delta Request. For any of the kids out there, we do have those reaction videos coming out on Wednesday, so make sure to stay tuned to those. And if you know anyone else, who may be interested in DQ, please share this video over to them. Any questions or movie recommendations, please make sure to put those in the comments below. And remember, be brave, be happy, and be kind, and we'll catch you all next time.